Hi, John Hess from FilmmakerIQ.com. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the history of Hollywood film posters and explore some key artists who have shaped this commercial art form. The movie poster dates back as far as the motion picture itself, and why shouldn't it? I mean, signs for events have been needed since antiquity but the paper poster first came into prominence only in the early 1800s, and it started with an actor, or rather a failed actor, Johann Alois Senefelder. Now, Senefelder was getting ready to study law when his father, a prominent actor in Prague, suddenly died. In an attempt to support his mother and eight siblings, Senefelder tried to step into his father's shoes as an actor. He couldn't replicate his father's success, but the draw of theater was strong. The Senefelder was also a playwright, so he turned to publishing. He found better luck there, seeing some success in his first published play, Connoisseur of Girls. But getting something published in the 1790s was extremely expensive, and Senefelder's next publication took him into debt. So Senefelder put his mind to trying to figure out a new inexpensive way of printing. Now one day in 1795, Senefelder's mother called him from the other room, asking him to write down a list of items that she was sending out to laundry. Now having no paper around, Senefelder took a grease pencil and wrote the list on a flat limestone slab that printers use to mix ink on. Then on a hunch, Senefelder decided to etch the stone with acid. And sure enough, the list written in grease remained on the stone. Well, Sinefelder was onto something here, and after a year of perfecting the process, he joined up with some music publishers and began producing musical scores with this much cheaper process that he called stone printing. But the process would be better known by its French name, lithography. It wasn't just musicians that took to lithography. Because the stone plate is prepared by directly drawing on the stone using familiar artist tools like pencils and crayons, artists took to lithography as early as 1803. Now, Senefelder kept perfecting the process. After his death, others like Goodfoy Engelman of Mulhouse in France added color with chromolithography. So by the time we get to proto-film in the 1890s with magic lantern projection shows, lithography and poster making was a fully mature industry and artistic medium. Here, a beautiful lithograph by French artist, color lithography pioneer, and some say father of the poster, Jules Charest, for the Magic Lantern show Projections Artistiques in 1890. He would later go on to make another highly regarded poster for Théâtre Optique's program called Pantomimes Luminaises. And now we get to the poster that I use over and over again in these courses to represent the Lumiere Brothers' groundbreaking first ever commercial public film screening on December 26, 1895 in the basement of the Grand Café in Paris. This poster, illustrated by Marceline Azul, depicts a scene from the film La Rochere à Rosé, the sprinkled sprinkler, marking the first time a poster was used not only to advertise a film, but to advertise a specific film, and even the first time the movie scene was depicted in a poster. Now, across the pond in the United States, as Thomas Edison consolidated his control and standardized the newborn film industry in the late 1800s and the turn of the century, he standardized the movie poster as well. The one sheet, 27 inches wide by 41 inches tall, became the standard dimension for Hollywood movie posters, shown inside and out of the movie theater. Variations came with the one sheet from the three sheet poster, the six sheet poster, and even up to the 24 sheet billboard style poster, which measures about nine feet by 20 feet. Now, keep in mind that this is an era of this single screen venue, from Nickelodeons even moving into the movie palaces of the 1910s, these theaters had only one screen, which they would show only one preset program of films. So when a theater played a certain movie, 
the entire advertising for that theater was dedicated to just that one film. To complement the movie poster, which was posted on the outside of the building, a variety of smaller advertising sizes popped up, from the window card, which measures 14 by 22, to the lobby card, which features scenes from the film and printed on 11 by 14 cardstock, and usually displayed in a set of eight. Other sizes like banners, door panels, and subway sheets have also evolved as promoters saw their need. During the first half of the studio era, where studios owned both the means of production and the theaters that distributed their own products, the production of advertising materials were handled in-house. Now, it's important to note, just as theaters were operated differently in those days, movie distribution also worked differently. Today, a movie opens wide pretty much everywhere at once. Well, back then, a film opened in only a few major cities before rolling out to smaller markets and rural areas. Now, this rolling out process was facilitated using a network of studio-owned central offices or film exchanges that carried the actual print of the movie as well as a press kit consisting of posters and other advertising paraphernalia. Each theater would come into the film exchange and check out a copy of the film and posters for their run and then return them all when the run was finished. In this case, movie posters and lobby cards would be used over and over again as movies made their way from town to town. Well, this shipping and handling was starting to become a logistical nightmare, especially with something as fragile as a movie poster. This was a business that the studios would happily outsource. The National Screen Service, originally created in 1920 to create movie trailers for the studios, saw an opportunity in the movie poster business as well. By the mid-1940s, most of the major studios had deals with the NSS to manage their movie poster distribution. The studio would send the NSS the artwork, the NSS would print and distribute the movie paper, as it was called, directly to the local film offices and theaters and print new ones as pieces became damaged. To manage all of that, the NSS developed a numbering system, which happens to be really useful for the modern poster collector. From 1943 to 1977, the NSS marked posters with two digits, followed by a slash and then up to four digits. The first two digits were the last two digits of the year of release, and the last digits indicate what number film it was. So if you saw 58223, that meant the film was released in 1958 and was the 223rd movie to be released that year. In this case, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman. If the poster was a reissue, you would see an R at the beginning of the number. Now, sometime in 1977, they removed the slash. Through arrangements with all the major studios, the NSS basically held a natural monopoly on poster production. Nearly 90% of all Hollywood posters found their way to the public through the NSS offices. But their control of the industry began to fade in the 70s and 80s with the rise of the modern multiplex and a new strategy of wide release. Now, now a lobby couldn't be dedicated to just one film. So sizes like half sheets, three sheets, and lobby cards started to disappear. Now, secondly, with the wide release strategy, which took advantage of economies of scale with national advertising, you don't need to keep track of replacement movie paper. With a simpler movie poster ecosystem, studios took back the responsibility for creating their own posters. By the end of the 1990s, the NSS had only three offices remaining. In September of 2000, Technicolor purchased what was left of the NSS and shut down the remaining offices. Although lobby cards have all but disappeared, a new type of movie paper has begun to grace the lobbies of multiplexes, the movie standee. These are often cleverly designed cardboard creations that entice fans to interact and grab a picture for a bit of word of mouth advertising via social media. Unfortunately, their sheer size makes the market for collectible standees a little bit difficult. We breeze through the business history of posters, but let's jump back and look at some of the art created by key illustrators and designers throughout the years. And honestly, this is where you can really get lost in some amazing work. 
Although the rise of posters as an artistic medium grew from the roots established in Paris by the likes of aforementioned Jules Chavier, poster design exploded all through Europe being influenced by Art Nouveau, Cubism, Dadism, Surrealism, and the Bauhaus and Swiss schools of design. There's even fascinating developments in Poland, where, which has its own history of avant-garde movie poster design that grew from communist control and censorship of all but poster production. But that's a story for a different time. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus mainly on the Hollywood movie poster. In the United States, early movie poster design took a different evolution than our European counterparts. Born of the brightly colored poster advertising traveling circuses, the illustration stylings of influential Edward Penfield, who many consider the father of the American poster, and William H. Bradley, once the highest paid illustrator in the early 20th century, the earliest Hollywood movie posters showed a unique version of American Art Nouveau. Now, very little information can be found about the specific artists in this early silent era, as so much of the work was done anonymously. Now, as beautiful as some of these seem to us now, well, they weren't considered high art in their time. And most of these probably ended up in the garbage heap after being used by theater after theater. The beginnings of what we might consider as the modern poster really began in the early 1940s. And although it's really hard to pinpoint a single individual, one artist does really stand out in this era, Bill Gold. Trained as an illustrator, a graphic designer, and a photographer, Gold started his career at Warner Brothers, working on this poster for Yankee Doodle Dandy. But if there's one studio era film that defines Gold's contribution to the modern poster, it would be the one for Casablanca. Now he may not have been the first to employ the collage style poster, but the subtlety of shape, placement, and pose of each of these leading and supporting characters presents the story of the film brilliantly without using any words. In 1962, Gold opened up his own firm, Bill Gold Advertising, and the list of movie posters he's been involved with as a designer is absolutely stunning. From My Fair Lady, to Hair, Clockwork Orange, Alien, Deliverance, James Bond for Your Eyes Only, Bullet, Dirty Harry, oh, not to mention every single Clint Eastwood movie until Gold's retirement in 2004. Not only did Gold design many of these posters, but as we shall see, many fantastic artists would find their start with his agency. Now, backing up to the 1950s, of course, we have the name that dominates so much of movie design, Saul Bass. Though he may not be known for, he may be better known for his title sequences, Bass was influential in the spread of minimalism and kinetic typography in movie poster design. As we glance at some of his pieces, we see a much more emphasis on simple but powerful shapes. Bass would probably be more of a bridge between the American illustrative poster and the more abstract posters that were coming out of Europe. Now, working with Bill Gold and Saul Bass was an illustrator from Kansas by the name of Bob Peake. A peak was first hired to illustrate the poster for West Side Story. Not the iconic Fire Escape Minimalist poster that Bass was responsible for, but this one. From there, Peak made his way to Bill Gold's agency, where he illustrated My Fair Lady, In Like Flint, and Excalibur. A Peak's most iconic work would come later in posters for Superman, Star Trek, Apocalypse Now, and a film that would turn Bruce Lee into a legend, Enter the Dragon. Uh, working around the same time and also for gold was an illustrator by the name of Richard Amsel. While at art school in Philadelphia, Amsel won a 20th Century Fox talent search with a poster for Barbara Streisand's Hello Dolly, which was actually used as the official poster. Amsel worked on several movie posters before gaming, gaining acclaim for his illustrative covers for TV Guide. Perhaps his most notable work was for George Lucas and Steven Spielberg with the Raiders of the Lost Ark. He did two separate posters, one for the film's initial 1981 release and another for the re-release a year later, which is now inseparable from the film itself. 
Unfortunately, Amsel's career was cut short as he died from complications of AIDS just shy of his 38th birthday. Another illustrator had to take up the pencil at Lucasfilm, Drew Struzan. Struzan's first encounter with Lucas the Universe came when he was asked to create the figure drawings for the 1978 re-release of Star Wars. Dubbed the Circus Poster, it cleverly simulates a torn poster bill as a way to fit the credit block beneath the artwork. Struzan worked on iconic 80s movies like Blade Runner, The Thing, Cannonball Run, the Police Academy series, Back to the Future, E.T., the Extraterrestrial, The Muppet Movie, Coming to America, First Blood, Risky Business, An American Tale, and The Goonies, just to name a few. But he will probably be forever known by his association with Star Wars, for which he created posters for the 1990 re-releases and the prequels, as well as picking up Indiana Jones after Ansel's death with Temple of Doom, The Last Crusade, and the Kingdom of Crystal Skull before he retired. In the same league as Struzan is John Alvin. Alvin was working as an animator when he got invited by a friend to work on the poster for Mel Brooks's Blazing Saddles. Now, Brooks loved Alvin's work so much that he brought him back for Young Frankenstein, History of the World Part One, Silent Movie, and Spaceballs. And after that, Alvin really didn't need to look for work as his phone was constantly ringing with poster requests. His work includes the iconic poster for Blade Runner, Cocoon, 10, Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, The Lion King, Empire of the Sun, Rain Man, Batman Returns, and Batman Forever. Again, just to name a few. As you might be able to conclude, as we get into the 80s and 90s, illustrated posters began to fall out of fashion in favor of digital photography. That's not to say that photography and digital can't create the visual flights of fancy that illustration can. Although it's really easy to be cynical and bemoan the dearth of creativity in modern film posters with its over-reliance on tropes and cliches, well, the fact is the same could be said of the actual films themselves. It might be considered low art by some, but the movie poster and paper advertising have the power to promise adventure, laughs, thrills, desires, and titillation, while at the same time being a catalyst for the strong emotional memories that we create when we go to the movies. It's just advertising, yes, but it's also iconography, a strange intersection between art and commerce where you really can find some great inspiration. Now we've listed six artists, but there are countless more, both past and present. Do some research, get inspired, and go out there and make something that demands an awesome poster. Make something great. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Consider becoming a patron on Patreon. I'm John Hess, and I'll see you at filmmakeriq.com. <laughs>